Well, hello, church. I want to welcome all of you who are watching right now. I want to thank you for taking time to connect with us today. Daniel chapter 3 is where we're going, um, and I want to start out with a question. And I know it's a dumb question, um, but, I, but I need you to humor me, and I need you to participate. All right? How many of you right now are dealing at some level with stress, anxiety, or worry in your life? Would you just like type that's me or yes or no in the chat box? Because we really want to know. And, and we want to know really because we want to reinforce this idea of you're not alone. They were all in this together. And I want to remind you that, that God is, is bigger than anything that we're going through, including what's happening in our lives right now, including what's causing stress and anxiety and worry. One of the things that's, that's causing me stress is the fact that we're not together in church. And so as a staff, we sat around and, and we've been trying to come up with these creative ideas of how we can connect with you, how we can see you, how you can see us, how we can kind of connect together as a church. And so starting this week, we're going to have some Zoom sessions. And so at the end of this message, uh, you can go to our website, yourcentralchurch.com, and there'll be a button that you can click to schedule a Zoom meeting with the staff. There'll be a few times every day that we'll jump on and, and we'll have Zoom sessions just to kind of check in, just to kind of chat, and just to kind of um, share some stories with each other. So I would encourage you to do that because we really, 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 really do miss you during this time, and we really do want to connect with you, and we really do want to remind you and ourselves uh, that we're all in this together. With that, before we get into the message, I, I kind of want to set the message up today like this. And some of you will know what I'm talking about, and some of you won't. Most of you will. What I'm about to describe to you has happened in my life about 970 million times since I've been a homeowner. Have you ever just been laying in bed late at night, trying to go to sleep, and as you're about to fall asleep, as, as, as the day is, is winding down and, and everything just kind of is running out of your mind and you, could just, you can just feel the weight of your eyes just closing and sleep is about to finally come and you hear, chip. You, you know what I'm talking about? You, you, ever, you know what I'm talking about? Like that, chip. Some of you don't know what the chip is. The chip is a smoke detector in your house that has decided to freak out and ruin the rest of your night. Usually, when that happens in my house, I do what most Christians do in a situation where we're faced with stress and anxiety. I lay in bed, and I pray that, that God is just going to take it away, that God is just going to make the smoke detector, magically recharge his battery, or, or whatever. And, and I'm like, hey, God could do that, right? Because God is big. God could do anything. God is bigger than anything that we're going through. And usually, um, God doesn't say yes to my prayer. Because after praying that prayer, a few minutes later, I always hear the chip. And at this point, I get angry. I get stressed out. My anxiety starts building out. And, and, and I, I really do start getting a little bit mad because I have to get out of bed. I have to get Mary out of bed. And then it's a quest to find the stinking smoke detector in our house. Now, the only way that you can tell which smoke detector has lost its mind is to go and stand underneath every smoke detector and listen. Chip. That's not it. It's over here. And, and, and before long, like you're walking all around your house, and before long you're standing on your kitchen counter in your underwear listening at every smoke detector. And, 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 and you get angry, right? And, and you get upset because you're supposed to be sleeping. This usually happens to me on nights before I have to preach. And I'm always like, God, why can't this happen to somebody else? My dog, my dog gets freaked out by this. I don't know if it's because he thinks the family is going to die or if it's just the noise of the chirp that drives him nuts, but he gets stressed out and he starts walking in circles. He starts barking. He starts whimpering. He loses his mind. And, and, and listen, it, 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 when, we get, when we get stressed out, when we get angry, we, we, get, we get angry at irrational things, like you're angry at batteries. Why would you be angry at batteries? You get angry at your spouse. And, and, and when, you, when you start going into these places, you start making 
illogical, irrational statements and decision. Like, like, like I, I started thinking, I'm ripping all the smoke detectors out of my house. Like, I'm just going to take them all out. Like, literally. I, I was, one time, I was like this close to just pulling them out of the ceiling because I was so upset. And so, finally, you figure out which one it is, and you change the battery, and, and, and you go to bed, and you think everything's fine. But then, you begin to focus on the situation, right? And, and you begin to focus on on, on what really might have been happened, what, what, what might have really happened. And when you do that, you begin to bring like stress and anxiety into your life. Because what I think in that moment is, what if it wasn't the battery? What if it was something else? Like what if my house really is on fire? What if there really is smoke somewhere? Like what if there's really a fire in the basement? I didn't go down there, I didn't check down there. What if there's smoke in my attic? I didn't check that out. And, and, and usually when I do that within five minutes, man, I'll have everybody in my family, all of us, dead and buried, the house burnt down. I mean, it's just crazy. But think about it. You can take a circumstance, any circumstance, and when you get stressed out, if you get focused on that circumstance and you take it to its fullest illogical conclusion, we go to some jacked up places sometimes, don't we? Many of us go places in our mind that God has never even been. You know what I'm saying? And, and so that's where stress and anxiety and worry come from. It comes from things that happen in our life that are unplanned for, things that are unprepared for. N nobody watching Nobody's ever been stressed out about something that was planned in your life. In fact, if everything went according to your plans, you'd probably never experience any stress or worry or anxiety or fear, correct? But, when, but we, we experience stress when things happen that are unplanned for or unprepared for. For example, you experience stress and anxiety when you get the bill in the mail that you weren't expecting, right? You experience stress and anxiety and worry when you get a phone call from the school, when you look at your phone, 792-8001, and, and, and on the other end, they say, I need to talk to you about your kid. You experience stress and anxiety and worry and fear when the boss says, I need you to come into my office so we can have a little talk before you leave today. We experience stress and anxiety and worry and fear every time the governor comes on TV right now to give us a virus update. Those things bring legitimate stress, anxiety, worry, and fear into our life. And so the message today is not how do we get out of stress and anxiety and worry and fear because we're always going to deal with those things. We're always going to have stress. We're always going to have anxiety. We're always going to have worry. There's always going to be fear in our life. And so I'm not going to tell you today how to get out of that because we live in that world. I am, however, going to tell you how to get through it because the unplanned for and the unprepared for are always going to take place in our lives. And so this is not a, how do I get out of this? This is, how do we walk through it? How do we deal with it? So let me cover a couple of points here that we really need to nail down before we get into the Bible story today. If we don't get the first one down, if we don't get this right, if we can't wrap our minds around this, then the rest is really not gonna help you at all, all right? So Number one, the first thing that we've got to do is we've got to understand that no matter what we're going through, no matter what situation that we're in, God is holy and good. We need to understand that God is holy and God is good. No matter what we're going through, no matter what we're going through, he is holy and he is good. The character of God never changes. The word holy means perfect, means without sin. It means that God has never made a mistake. It means God has never had to tell anybody, oh, my bad, oops, I, I messed that up. God, God has never had to do that because God is holy and God is good. I've had people ask me, um, is there anything God can't do? Yes, he can't stop being holy. He cannot stop being holy, and because he can't stop being holy, he can't stop being good, right? God is holy and God is good no matter what is going on in our life. And, and, and we, need to, we, we need to understand that and we need to keep that in mind and we also need to understand, especially right now, that our circumstances never alter his character. Our circumstances will, will never alter his character. What we're going through will never change the fact that God is holy and God is good. Because number two, God's presence is bigger than your problem. God's presence is bigger than your problem. Listen, I, I, know, I know these are difficult times, but God is way bigger than what we're going through. 
Number three, we need to stop fighting for control. <laughs> we need to stop fighting for control. And, and I laugh at that because, listen, <laughs> I'm the world's worst, man. I'm a huge control freak. Some of you have heard me say this before. Some of you have been in this situation with me before. If we're going somewhere today, I'm driving. I'm not riding with you because you're a horrible driver. I don't care who you are. You're just, I'm just better. I just am, and, and I have to be driving. Like, if I'm riding for, with somebody, how many of you do this? How many of you, like, honestly, like, just, just let us know in the chat. How many of you do this? You're riding with somebody, you do the brake thing. You know what I'm talking about? Whoa, 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 whoa. And, and anybody do that? Anybody do that? Anybody look at people and say, stop texting. You text. I know, but I'm okay too. Like, I, I know how to do it. Like, right? We, we, we fight for control. But I want you to listen to me. Because God loves you so much, he's going to constantly remind you of how little control you really do have. That's how much God loves you. And so if you're like, my day is falling apart, ah! that's God going, "Uh uh-huh, sure is. (laughs) Want to do it again? Want to go through it again? You want to do it? Because listen, 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 listen. Control is the greatest illusion in the entire universe. It's amazing when we, when we reflect on how little control we actually have. Think about it. You, you didn't control where you were born. You didn't control who your parents were. You could be the safest driver in the world. And on your way home today, you can run a red light and somebody who's unsafe comes through and just bam! Like you have so little control. It's not even funny, which, by the way, when when I, control freak Ryan, when I reflect on how little control I really do have, it drives me to my knees in worship. It really does, because I realize if I'm not in control, somebody else is in control. It's him who's in control, and he's so much greater than me, and we've got to stop fighting that. We've got to stop fighting control. Now, let's get to Daniel chapter 3. And we're going to see three guys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, Quick background. These three guys um, live in a region where a guy named Nebuchadnezzar is king. Nebuchadnezzar is king of of Babylonia. And he has built a statue of himself that's 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide, and it's solid gold. And he tells everybody in the region, everybody in the land, he says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to play some music, and you're all going to bow down to the statue. Now, let me just be honest with you. If I'm there, and you're probably right there with me right now, you're you're probably going to be like, I'm bowing down to nothing. I'm not going to bow down. Like, who does this guy think that he is? I'm not going to bow down. And then Nebuchadnezzar comes back, and he says, oh, hey, by the way, if you don't want to bow down, the fine print says if you don't bow down, we're going to throw you in the furnace. Uh, I mean, bowing down ain't so bad. Like, what do you think, John? Like, maybe we ought to just bow down. I, I don't know. See, Here's the deal. When we're told to do something that we say, um, well, let me say it like this. When we're told to do something and, um, and we say that we're not going to do it, the enemy is always going to put pressure on us, right? When we're told to do something and we say, nah, I'm not going to do that, the enemy is always going to put pressure on us. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego understood that. And so they play the music and they didn't bow down. They're like, you know what? God is good. God is holy. God is with us. God is in control. We're not going to bow down. And so they didn't bow down, and they didn't die. They didn't even get thrown in the furnace immediately. They just stood there. Like, everybody's bowing down, and they're like, look at those fools, man. Those guys bowing down. We're not going to do it. And they're just standing there. All of a sudden, somebody comes to Nebuchadnezzar in verse 12, and they're like, Nebuchadnezzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they won't bow down. And Frankie called me a bad name. And no, 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 no. If you've got kids, that whole scene right there, it just kind of plays out, right? Kind of brings you a little bit of stress and anxiety and worry. Like you just, you understand that, the tattletale. Now, I want to show you. If you're watching right now and you've got, and you've got this, you've got this stress, you've got this anxiety, you've got this fear, you've got this worry in your life, I want to show you where it comes from. And I want to show you how to move past it because reality is this. There are some people watching right now that you are stressed out. You've got high levels of anxiety. You are freaking out. Like right now you feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders. You're stressed out in your marriage. You're stressed out in your job. 
You're stressed out with the government. You're stressed out with the relationship. I'm going to show you where it comes from, and I'm going to show you how to get past it. Watch this. We're going to pick up in verse 13. Furious with rage. Now, Nebuchadnezzar has a few anger issues, right? It's fine. He meets Jesus later. Don't worry about it. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these, 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 these men are brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar says to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold that I have made? Verse 15. Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, then you will be thrown immediately into the burning furnace. And, and this right here is where he crosses the line. Then... What God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Now, I don't know what God had planned, but I'm pretty sure right here God is in heaven going, oh, no, you didn't. Oh, no, you did not just say, like, I will punch you in the throat, Nebuchadnezzar. I'm pretty sure on some level that happened right there when he said, what God will rescue you from my hand? They play the music again. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't bow. So they're brought before the king, and King Nebuchadnezzar, listen, the enemy, this is, this is the enemy. King Nebuchadnezzar is the enemy. He tells them, hey, listen, I'm gonna give you another opportunity. I'm a fair guy. I'm a little ticked right now, but I'm a fair guy. I'm gonna give you another chance. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna play some music one more time. If you bow down, awesome. If not, listen, you're going to go into the furnace and nobody is going to be able to save you. The enemy, don't miss this. The enemy will always try to control you through fear, intimidation, and manipulation. Always. Fear, intimidation, and manipulation. Let me tell you, he's coming after you. The enemy is coming after you. Fear and anxiety and worry and stress come from when the unplanned, or the unprepared for, take place in our life. And once again, when we begin to dwell on what's happening, and when we begin to dwell on the circumstances, when we begin to dwell on the negative, when we begin to dwell on what's happening, we cannot focus on Jesus. L listen, we all have a choice to make every single day. Am I going to be focused on my circumstances, or am I going to be focused on Jesus? Every day, every day we wake up with a decision to make. Am I going to be focused on what's bad today, or am I going to be focusing on Jesus? Am I going to be focusing on what's going on around me, or am I going to be focusing on Jesus? Am I going to be focused on this that's happening right here, or am I going to focus on the fact that Jesus is holy and he is good? Am I going to focus on the size of my problem, or am I going to be focused on the size of my God? Because listen, we cannot focus on both. We can't. You can either focus on the size of your problem, or you can focus on the size of your God, but you can't focus on both. And listen to me. The, the focusing on our circumstances, and, uh, our circumstances and, and focusing on the size of our, our problem thing always lead to stress and anxiety and worry and fear. Focusing on God and focusing on Jesus always allows us to walk in the freedom that God intended for us to walk in in the first place. Understand this. This is truth. Every one of us have an enemy. Every one of us. Every one of us has an enemy, the devil. He's real. Jesus talks about him a lot. In John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus calls him the father of lies. In John chapter 10, um, verse 10, he says the enemy's goal is to steal, kill, and destroy. You and I, if you're a follower of Jesus, really do have an enemy. In fact, even if you're not a follower of Jesus, he, he's not your friend. You really do have an enemy. He's the devil. And he's always going to try to get you to focus on circumstances that overwhelm you. That is why you lay in bed at night. And after you lay there 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, you can't go to sleep because you've gotten so worried and so focused on what's going on around you. Listen. Who or what you listen to will ultimately determine what you do. Who or what you listen to will ultimately determine what you do. And, and if you're focused on the voice of the enemy, you're controlled by fear and stress and worry and anxiety. If you're focused on the voice of God, you're controlled by faith. There is no middle ground. That's why we teach all the time here at Central, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. Because listen, the truth of God's word can shatter the lies of the enemy. Think about this. 
Jesus, when he was, he was tempted three times in the scripture. What did he do all three times? Quoted scripture, right? Quoted the Bible. The enemy does not want you focused on Jesus. He wants you focused on your circumstances because if he can get you and me focused on our circumstances, he can keep us in the bondage of worry and fear and stress and anxiety, right? Let's keep reading because it gets even better. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Ebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown in the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. In other words, they're like, you know what? Here's what we know about God, king. Let me, let me list it out for you. God is holy. God is good. God is with us. God is in control, and you are not. And God can save us. Here's the problem with us in church sometimes. I know people in the church world who, who try to control God, but we try to control him through what we call righteous acts or, or good deeds. The Bible calls them filthy rags, but we call them righteous. Like, like we'll read our Bible, or we'll come to church, or we'll tune in to an online church service. We'll write a tithe check. We'll volunteer. We'll do all these great things, and, and then something bad happens, and we go, how could you let that happen, God, after all I've done for you? How could you allow this to happen to me? And God's like, oh, that's why you were doing it? That's why you were doing that thing? See, anybody can follow Jesus when everything is good. The question is not, will you follow me when things are good? The question that Jesus has asked us is, will you follow me? Will you follow me? In good times and bad, in easy times and hard times, will you follow me? That's what we have to put our focus on today. Who are we going to follow? Who are we going to follow? See, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't try to control God through religion. And, and, and here's, here's why we know. And it's verse 18, and, and, and verse 18, honestly, is one of the strongest verses in the entire Bible. They're standing before the king, and they're like, we're not going to bow down. We're not going to do it, because you say you're going to throw us into the furnace, but God is able to save us from the furnace. But then look at this. Look what happens. But even if he does not, even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, we will not serve your gods or serve the image of gold you have set up. Hey, God is great. God is able. God can do all this. But here's what we want you to know, king. Even if he doesn't save us from you, we'll go into the fire. That's strong. That is strong. I don't know about you, but if you're directing a movie, isn't this a good place for God to kind of swoop in to save them right here? It, it is, but God doesn't come swooping in. In fact, watch what happens. Look at this. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. And he ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. Listen to me. You're going to get to the end of this message, and it's probably not going to get any easier. In fact, before you come out of what you're going through, the furnace might get turned up seven times hotter. It might get seven times hotter at work tomorrow. It might get seven times hotter with your kids. It might get seven times hotter in your marriage. It might, well, that might not be a bad thing, seven times hotter. That's probably another message for another time. But it, 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 you, you know what I mean. It, it, might get, it might get seven times hotter with this virus thing. It might get seven times hotter in what you're going through. Shadmach, Meshach, and Abednego, they did the right thing, and it got turned up seven times hotter for them. And, and then watch what happens. The Bible says, then he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men were wearing robes and trousers, turbans, and other clothes. They were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the fire was so hot that the flames of the fire killed. Don't miss this. The flames of the fire killed the soldiers that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men firmly tied. Look at this. These three men firmly tied fell into the blazing furnace. Point number four, focus on the size of your God, not your circumstances. Focus on the, the size of your God and not your circumstances. Because it's easy for us to lose focus, right? I, I don't know how it is at your house, but, but men. <laughs> at my house, 
My wife knows where everything is. She knows exactly where it is. She knows exactly where it can be found. I know where nothing is, apparently. The other day, I lost my keys. Could not find my keys. I looked everywhere for my keys. I promise you, I looked in every single spot that my keys could ever possibly be. I asked Mary. She said, did you look on your desk? No, it never occurred to me to look on my desk where I place my keys every single day. And I'm like, I looked there. And she looked at me and just smiled. Does your wife ever just give you that smile? You know what I'm talking about? That smile that says, I love you, but dang it, you are as dumb as a rock. You ever get that one? She's like, go look on your desk. I went, I looked right on my desk. They were right there. Like, I don't know how I overlooked them. I still think she had them in her purse. And when I went and looked somewhere else, she went and she put them over there. I think she was messing with me. You see what you're prepared to see, don't you? You know that, right? So with that in mind, let's, let's read the rest of this. Watch this, verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement. Now, now kings at this time period did not leap to their feet in, amazing, in amazement for anything. But, but he's watching this whole thing. I don't know if he had it on a jumbotron or whatever, but he could see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. I'm not sure how, but he could see them in the fire. The Bible says this. He leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up? Don't miss that. Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, O king. Verse 25. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. It was that fourth guy he couldn't get over. We know, looking back, that it's Jesus in the fire. But can you see Nebuchadnezzar doing this? Nebuchadnezzar threw them in. The enemy, he's gloating. He's excited. He had won. He had told everybody, hey, (coughs) sorry, you don't bow down, you're going to get thrown into the fire. See, the enemy thinks he's won every time he's thrown us into the fire. And Nebuchadnezzar, he thinks he's won. And he's watching this. And he goes, hmm, one, two, three, four. Hey, 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 come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. How many people did we throw in the fire? Oh, we threw, we threw three, old king. How many people do you see in there? Uh, four? Like, you, you see that fourth guy. I'm not the only one that sees that fourth guy. Do you see that fourth guy? Yeah, I see the fourth guy. D- don't miss this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't see Jesus until they got into the fire. All right? If you're in the fire today, if you're in the middle of stress and worry and fear and anxiety, You need to stop praying, Jesus, get me out of this, and start praying, Jesus, let me see you. Listen, he is trying to reveal himself to you in a way that you have never seen him before. And many times, we don't see him clearly until the furnace has been heated seven times hotter and we're in the middle of the fire. But when we see him clearly, we'll follow him closely. And the reason people don't follow Jesus closely is we've never seen him in the fire because we scream, get me out of here, rather than, let me see you. Let me see you. Let me make you a promise. If you're watching today and you're not a Christian, he loves you enough to take you through the fire to get your attention because that's what he did for me. But if you're watching and you are a Christian and you're walking through the fire, he's trying to show you a part of himself that you've never seen. And your prayer simply needs to be, Jesus, let me see you. Teach me who you are in this fire. Allow me to see you. Let me see who you are and what I'm going through. Open your eyes. Open your eyes and listen because he is there. How do you know he's there, Ryan? Because he's holy. Because he's good. Because he promised to be with you. And he's in control. And all he's asking you to do today is open your eyes. And number five, embrace freedom. Embrace freedom. This is my favorite part. I love this section right here because it is so good. Watch this, verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the most high God. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Isn't this the guy that was talking smack about God several verses earlier? There weren't any gods that were going to be able to save you? 
Right? Isn't he the guy who said that? Who is going to be able to save you from my hand? And now he's like, servants of the most high God in less than a chapter. Don't, 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 don't miss this because this is huge. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have to get this. Everybody around you, Christians and non-Christians, are watching how you walk through the fire. How you walk through the fire can teach them more about God than any theology class you could ever go to. If we will walk through the fire like we know Jesus and we know he's with us, people who don't know Jesus will come to Jesus because of how you and I walk through the fire. Nebuchadnezzar did. Look at this. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. Watch this. And the stratops, the perfects, the governors, the royal advisors crowded around him, and they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their head singed. They saw that the fire had not burned their bodies, nor was a hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Hold on. No smell of fire? They were in the furnace, and the Bible says they didn't even smell like smoke. In fact, the Bible says, unbound and unharmed, unbound and unharmed. Don't miss this. They went into the fire. They went into that furnace tied up. They came out of the furnace. They came out of the fire, unbound and unharmed. The only thing that was burned off in the furnace was what the enemy tried to put on them in the first place. Don't miss this. What God wants to remove from you in the furnace is what the enemy tried to stick on you before you went into the fire. What God wants to remove from you in the fire, in the furnace, is what the enemy tried to stick on you before you even went through it. The enemy has tried to bind you, and he threw you in the fire. And and what the enemy wanted to use for harm, God is using for good. God is going, "Uh uh-huh, I can use that. I'll I'll, I'll burn that off you. You won't even be touched in the fire. They came out unbound and unharmed. That's good news for us who are in the fire today, right? That's good news. The only thing that's going to be burned off for you in the fire is what the enemy tried to put on you in the first place. The Bible goes on to say this in verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar says this, praise be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This guy's already turned into a worshiper. Isn't that awesome? He he, he had already lost. He's gone from there is no God to praise Jesus. That's where he went. Praise be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Verse 29. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces. Because we tried to furnish thing. Um, that didn't work, and so now we're going to cut somebody. Like, that's, that's what's happening here. And their houses be turned into a pile of rubble because there is no other God who can save this way. There's no other God who can save this way. Watch this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Let me help you see what's happening here. If you're going through the fire, God is not trying to punish you. He's trying to promote you. He's not trying to push you down. He's trying to pull you up. That's just how he works. At the end of the day, when you don't understand him, and and, and listen, nobody does. Nobody does. The day we fully, the day we can fully understand God, he ceases to be God, right? When you don't understand him, you've got to trust him. How can I trust him, Ryan? It's very simple. You can trust him because he's holy. You can trust him because he's good. You can trust him because he is always with you. You can trust him because he is in control. And all he wants you to do is open your eyes, focus on him, and embrace the freedom that he's called you to walk in as a follower of him. It's that simple. See, here's the thing that blows my mind in this story. How many men went into the fire? How many? Three, right? How many men were in the fire? Four. How many men came out of the fire? I know the math is a little bit common core right now, but you've been homeschooling your kids, so you can do this simple math, right? Like, you you would think that if four were in the fire, four came out of the fire. 
But one person didn't come out of the fire. Jesus didn't come out of the fire. I love that. I love that. I want to close with this because this really wraps up the whole thing. God says this to Isaiah in, in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1. And um, I want you to look at this. It says this, but, but now this is what the Lord says, which makes it pretty important because the Lord said it. This is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who forms you, O Israel, look at this, fear not. Fear not. Do you, do you know that that phrase, fear not, or do not be afraid, or do not have fear, appears in the Bible like 366 times? One time for every day of the year, even leap year, I guess. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you see this? When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Why? Because I never left. I never left. I'm standing there, and I'm waiting on you. That's what Jesus is saying. You will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze because I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. He's still in the fire. So if you're in the fire today, going through a tough time, you're dealing with stress and fear and worry and anxiety, you're not alone because God is still with you. Jesus is walking with you. God says to us, I am with you. I love you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am holy. I am good. I am in control. And all I want you to do is open your eyes and focus on me so you can embrace the freedom that I have called you to walk in. That's how we move past church fear and stress and worry and anxiety and how we can walk in freedom. Let's pray. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that as followers, as followers of you, Jesus, we are not alone. God, I pray for every single person watching right now. God, the, the people right now that, 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 that are dealing with stress. Father, I, I pray that you would remind us today to, to focus on your word and not the word of the enemy. Father, the, the, those of us who are dealing with, with stress, this, this, this anxiety, this worry, this fear, that, that you would just remind us of, of who you are. Because one more time, God, we acknowledge that you are holy, you are good, you are with us, and you are in control. And I pray, God, that we can open our eyes and we can focus on you and we can embrace the freedom that you've called all of your children to walk in because you are that good. May we know today, Jesus, that no matter what happens to us and no matter what waits for us, you are in control. We love you, Jesus. We trust you, we worship you, and we praise you today. We thank you, God, for sending Jesus to save us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.